Well, good evening. I'm Carl's Bad Mayor Dale Janway, and I want to thank you for participating in our WIP Town Hall meeting, which is also being broadcast by Red Rocket on live stream. Our usual moderator, John Heaton, could not make it today. Ben Williams with the Department of Energy will be assisting us with tonight's agenda. We'll be keeping the same rules as we have left, as we have with our previous town hall meetings. We will have questions period after each presenter where we will allow people here and then online time to ask questions before we move on to the next topic. I'd like to welcome some special guests here tonight. Tim Keithley with Congressman Skeen's office. Hey, Congressman Pierce, I'm sorry. That's two times I've done it. <laughs> Congressman Pierce. George Brzezowski with EPA. And Coleman Smith with the New Mexico Environmental Department. I'd also like to thank Sam Plumley, Sue Lopez, Cheyenne Mathola, Charlie Garcia, Kyle Mark Steiner, and all the other City of Carlsbad employees who helped put this event together each week, along with the folks from the DOE, NWP, and CMARC who do the same. At the end of last week's meeting, Joe Franco and Bob McQuinn presented some of the steps being taken right now to improve the situation at WIP. I believe that right now WIP is headed in the right direction, discovering what went wrong, fixing it, and decontaminating so the underground facility can reopen. One item stressed by both accident reports is that much of what happened during the fire and radiological events was preventable. The WIP process works if it is being followed correctly. Our goal in concert with DOE is to safely reopen WIP now and maintain these standards far into the future. With that, I'll turn the microphone over to Ben Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome everybody here and those of you on the web tonight. Uh, this week's town hall meeting is co-sponsored by the Department of Energy and the City of Carlsbad. And I wanted to recognize one person in addition to who the mayor uh, recognized, and that is Jack Zimmerman is with us tonight. He is a member of the Accident Investigation Board. Uh, we had some time constraints last week. So in the final Q&A section tonight, we wanted you to have a chance to uh, ask questions and we'll be able to answer some and he can answer on behalf of the board. Uh, also, as the mayor said, we are continuing our format. If you would hold questions until the end, and we'll also have questions until the end of each section. We'll also have a general question session at the end. Um, to open tonight, we'll have Dana Bryson. He's our deputy manager at the Carlsbad field office and then he will be followed by Tammy Reynolds, our Deputy Recovery Manager. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Mayor Janway, for co-hosting this uh, town hall with us. And thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, Joe Franco sends his regrets that he couldn't be here, uh, but uh, we, we are committed to continuing these meetings, and tonight, um, we're going to talk more about uh, what we've done and where we're going. Uh, last week, we made an entry into room seven, panel seven, and um, learned some things. Uh, this week, we learned even more. We had some better pictures. We were able to have more time in the panel to look at things. And, and uh, we actually had pictures that showed the the roof in the immediate area actually is in good condition. However, we found that some bags were uh, damaged and relocated. We are currently evaluating the range of potential causes for this, and um, we're planning our next entry to learn even more and narrow that down. Uh, Tammy Reynolds will be talking more about that whole process. Lastly, we're happy to speak tonight about our expanded air monitoring network in the surrounding communities. And Bob McQuinn will be talking more about that. And so with that, I'll introduce Tammy Reynolds. Okay, thanks Dana. All right, good evening. This afternoon, what I'd like to do is walk you through, let me get to my slides. 
Okay, I'll walk you through the last two entries, and I'll start with um, the entry that we made last Wednesday, a week ago. Um, this was what we call phase three, and activity four of phase three. And I'll walk you through the scope of that entry, and then we'll look at the pictures, and I'll kind of point out some things in the pictures. So this entry, we had three teams of people. In the past, they go down in the mine through one of the shafts, the salt shaft. And in this particular case, if you remember the entry prior to that, that is where we started finding contamination when we got into panel seven. And so planning for this entry that was performed last Wednesday, a week ago Wednesday, we outfitted three individuals in the level B protective suits because we did not know as we progressed further into panel seven up to room seven, what type of contamination we were going to see. So we took a conservative approach and put them in the level B suits and BG4s were their respiratory equipment and then they approached the waste space, what we call the waste space in that panel. Now one of the things we talked about in the past is the challenge with the level B suits is the fact that your stay time, what we call stay time, is limited because when you're fully encapsulated in that suit, your body heat does cannot dispel outside of that suit and you build up heat in that and you actually lose weight, lose body mass when you're um, in those suits. So during that entry, the individuals had roughly 35 minutes, approximately 35 minutes from the time that they suited up and zippered and fully encapsulated themselves to proceed into panel seven and up to the waste space and take some pictures and then leave the um, panel and go back and then with the assistance of the radiological folks, they helped them get out of those suits and then made sure that um, no contamination, you know, they didn't receive any contamination on their skin or anything and then they were able to leave the mine. So it was a very successful entry from that perspective. The pictures that we did get, I'll go through those. As Dana indicated, it did not reveal to us any issues with the mine itself. The roof of the mine looked good and it gave us some helpful information as we planned for the entry that we performed this past Wednesday. So let me just... So what you're seeing right there... Grab this mic. This picture right here is one of the three individuals in the Level B protective gear and he's pointing a camera and a light at the waste space. So that is what we call the waste space. And what I mean by that is that was the last row of waste that was put into the mine prior to the fire event. And then subsequently the radiological event. And then with the same camera and light, there's another picture that shows the waste. And what we're gonna talk about a little bit more are these bags, these white bags, what we call um, magnesium oxide bags. And these bags are put into the underground because um, through they absorb things like carbon dioxide and moisture that's in the air. And so we're gonna focus in on these bags. And that was what, in these pictures, what we realized was that some of these bags had been disturbed. So we took that information and decided, okay, what do we want to put into our planning for the next activity? Based on the fact that during that entry, the contamination levels did not go much higher than what we had seen. They stayed in the range of about 10,000 to 20,000 D per M. We were able to make a decision that the next entry did not require the level B protective suits. And that was important and you know, advantageous to us for this next entry because that allowed us to be able to spend more time and gather additional information instead of being constrained by the stay time of those suits. So the entry that we made on April the 30th, you see in that picture there, this is a picture of an individual not in the level B suits, now they're in two pairs of coveralls and they're using the positive air respirators that have the filters associated with them. So again, this allowed the team to go back in. We determined from the previous entry we needed to get more information and more pictures associated with these magnesium oxide bags that looked like they were disturbed. 
So now I'll walk you through these pictures and point out the areas that we recognized in there and you're seeing just as we're looking at the same information. So here's one of the magnesium oxide bags that come, this is the way it is received by us. It stands straight up. It has inside that, it has um, cardboard like material that holds the magnesium oxide in place. These bags can weigh up to 3,000 pounds and um, the magnesium oxide is a granular white substance on the inside and as I indicated, it's used to absorb carbon dioxide and also moisture. If you look, and I'll show you, I've got several pictures, but if you look at this bag, and if you look at some of these bags along the wall here, and then also this one, and I've got a better picture in a minute, you can see that the form of those bags is not the same. They're not upright like the one that's got the 4200 on it. They're not sitting upright, and also they, they, don't, they look like they've been disturbed and don't necessarily look like the material is contained in the bags. Here's another picture, and in this particular case, you can see that this bag has been grossly disturbed, and what you're seeing there is the material on the outside of the bag has been, looks almost like it's been disintegrated or destroyed, and you're seeing the magnesium oxide sitting there without the bag around it. Again, here's another picture of the uh, right side of the um, room. And again, you see these pictures of the bags here. They're not sitting upright like this. You can see where it looks like the material on the bag is no longer intact and the magnesium oxide has, um, is still sitting there in place without the bag to support it or <clears throat> the bag or the carbon, um, the cardboard that surrounds the magnesium oxide. Oops, let me back up. So those are the pictures that we're currently evaluating and looking at. And, you know, just as you're seeing there, what does it tell us? It tells us that something has disturbed these bags. Something has degraded the material on the outside of these bags. But just as I walked through the pictures just a minute ago, what it doesn't tell us is what caused it. There's no evidence that we can see visually yet as to exactly what caused these bags and the material on these bags to be disturbed. So we're taking this information and we're planning our next entry in the next few days. And our intent in that entry is to go back in, let me go back to this picture. As you can see from this picture, these bags in the front, we need to get over those bags so that we can kind of get an aerial view of the waste behind those bags. And so the plans, the key plans for the next entry coming up is to get a camera on the end of an extension pole that we can reach over those bags and then get some, and again, I call them aerial shots, if you will, some aerial views of the um, waste um, and the containers behind those bags there. So that's what we have planned for the next entries. We um, will continue to evaluate the information and um, with that, we should be able to focus in and eventually determine what exactly caused this um, disturbance of these bags. And as you can see from that picture there, the roof of the mine looks good, looks to be in good shape. So we're still not ruling out any possibilities at this point, but every time we enter the mine, we're gathering more information that allows us to focus in on what is actually the cause that um, has um, caused this event and the um, release of the contamination. Okay. So we'll take questions in the room first and then we will look online for any questions. So you have no evidence so far that anything with a roof caused this, uh, which is, I guess, good news, especially for the geotechnical engineers and I considered that extremely unlikely from the beginning. However, in that one picture, uh, there uh, appear to be two uh, loose roof bolts that are hanging up there. Uh, and that is a bit surprising to me, because isn't it true that before the first waste goes into, the, into a new panel, uh, that the panel is actually certified to be reasonably safe 
uh, for the next, let's say, two, three years, however long it takes to fill the panel. And so the question is, did these two loose roof bolts that are visible in that video, did they surprise you or any of the experts at WIP? So the question is, and let me see if I can go back to a better picture to answer the, mm, no, okay. The question is regarding these roof bolts. This is not a great picture of those, but right up in the roof there, you could see these dark objects there. So we have bolts throughout the mine, not just in this panel, but part of um, the mine structure includes these bolts. And we do outfit every panel, and every panel has bolts associated with it. And as you indicated, we do have a certification of that panel before we go into service with it. These two bolts that you see and the lanyard that holds those in place, that is not abnormal whatsoever for what we see in the mine. So the mine, this particular room is in very good condition. We're not seeing any abnormal readings or any abnormal um, bolting. I agree that's not abnormal to see in the mine, uh, loose roof bolts, especially in the older mine workings, but this is one of the freshest excavations. And you're saying this would not be unusual to have two loose roof bolts next to each other in one of the freshest part of the mine? Our geotechnical engineers and mining managers um, have evaluated this room as well as the others, and we watch these conditions weekly. There's no abnormal activity in this room whatsoever. Okay, I have, I have multiple questions. I'm going to ask the ones that I think are related somewhat to okay. this topic, and we'll hold some of the other ones for later. Uh, what are the highest gamma readings near the room seven containers? What protection from gamma does the PPE provide? Okay, so the, the question was, what's the highest gamma readings? Yeah, what are the highest gamma readings near the room seven containers, and what protection from gamma does the PPE provide? Okay. I do not, off the top of my head, I don't remember the gamma readings. We've gotten 10 to 20,000 as the highest alpha readings, deeper M alpha. The gamma, I would have to, uh, we'll have to get that and send that back. I don't have that number with me. Okay. Uh, here's a pretty quick question. Will, photo, will the photos from the whip entry into panel 7, room 7, be available to the public soon? Uh, are they already on the website? Okay. Right. The so website. the photos are on the website. Okay, let's zoom up a little bit. Um, how can the DOE and WIP ensure us there are no special shielded containers such as RH lead-lined or neutron shielding in, in panel 7? I think they're basically asking if any of the RH, if there's any RH in, in panel 7 that was either the neutron shielded or lead, any of the, any things like that in panel 7. There are RH containers in panel 7. I, I think they mean the, um, the, the, the shielded containers, the RH shielded, if okay. there's any of those in panel seven. The, the shielded containers are not in panel seven. Okay. So those were received last year and they're in a different panel. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, here's one more. Uh, regarding materials used to store waste in, are there any technological advances that provide greater security for long-term storage? I guess there's asking if there's any recent develops and events in the industry that would secure these containers more. We continuously, so the question was um, containers, and we continuously evaluate technologies depending on the waste types that um, are requested to come to WIP that meet our requirements. So we're continuously looking at different technologies and working with the regulators. We have to certify these containers. So yes, there's ongoing effort to always look at um, other options for containers. Okay, and I think those are all the ones I have specifically okay. on this topic. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Tammy. Right, uh, Bob thanks. McQuinn will be up next. Three weeks ago, Stuart Jones from my environmental staff gave an update on our environmental sampling. All right, Tammy, which button is it here? No. Right? Okay, here we go. Okay. So uh, Stuart did a comprehensive review of environmental sampling. I'm going to give a pretty short update tonight, but I know not everybody is able to be at every town hall. So the big news from three weeks ago is that we've added four new air sampling locations in uh, surrounding town. So you can see from the chart that we've put new air samplers in Artesia, Loving, Eunice, and Hobbs. And we have now 
and, and we, we pulled the, the papers from those samplers every week. And so we wanted to present the, uh, the first weekly results uh, from those. Those samples go to our analytical laboratory uh, with WIP, and you see the results here. Basically, there's nothing detectable uh, as we would expect from any of those four sample locations. And these sample locations, just like all of the others where we do air sampling, are now part of a weekly sampling routine. And we'll keep giving uh, updates periodically. And obviously, if we find anything of interest, but, but basically tonight's report is to tell you that there's nothing of interest, but it's, uh, you know, it's encouraging that we continue to, to sample and we continue to find no detectable activity. So I'm going to run through some information that really is not very different from what Stuart went through three weeks ago. But now, instead of... 11 locations, we have 15 locations, and now we pull those samples every week, and we're up to 89 total samples, and uh, the new news is that there's nothing detectable in any of the recent results. This, uh, basically, you see the soil sampling. There's no change in that information from, uh, from what Stuart presented uh, three weeks ago. In terms of water sampling, there's no new information there. Um, Basically, the, uh, the two samples we took from a rain fall uh, back in March, there's, uh, you know, we've already reported that, uh, and there hasn't been a rainfall that's allowed us to collect any, any water samples, but, uh, but with the wet next rainfalls, we'll collect water samples around the WIP site. No new vegetation sampling, and then uh, just encourage all of you, uh, we do update the, uh, the environmental sampling on a weekly basis at, uh, at our recovery uh, website, and you see the address here. So just to recap, we have uh, 15 air samplers in place, four new ones at local communities, and as we expected, um, no, nothing detectable in any of those locations. So with that, I intended for it to be a short report. Any, any questions for me? Okay, you want to hold them till later? Okay, all right, thanks. Next up, we'll have Russell Hardy. Thank you, Ben, and good afternoon, everyone. Sue, you want to put my presentation up? Um, I hope my presentation is fairly brief as well. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I presented on uh, the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center's uh, sampling results and uh, Tonight, I just want to go over that again and talk about a few new developments. Uh, like NWP, CMERC is also expanding their um, air monitoring capabilities. And so we are in the process of adding three additional air sampling sites. One is in Loving, uh, one is in Carlsbad, and one will be uh, stationed on the northeast corner of the WIP site. And so we're currently having our sam sampling towers constructed um, and procuring the sampling equipment. So it'll probably be three or four weeks before those are actually deployed. So a couple of weeks ago, I, I showed uh, this graph and, and we've gotten some new results uh, added here, but I, I wanted to put all of these sampling points up here to kind of show um, the power that we had within the repository of the HEPA filtration system and how it reduced the level of activity from escaping out into the environment. And then also I wanted to show how that material that came out of the environment was further diluted by the air and the turbulence in the air. And if you'll remember back, it's probably been a month or so, uh, Fran Williams with uh, uh, URS was here and she demonstrated with the, the green food coloring when she put it in the water, how that dispersion takes place and how uh, it, it tends to uh, reduce the amount of, of, red, of food coloring or contamination. And so basically that's what you're seeing with these air sampling results. So to the left of this chart, you see the weeks uh, since the event and we're up to week nine now. Um, during the event, we had a, a daily average that week within the repository of 46,000 disintegrations per second of americium. And I've only thrown the americium values up here because uh, americium was found to be 10 times higher than plutonium. 
So uh, obviously that's a, a large amount of contamination present within the repository, but that's within the repository. Uh, then it went through a HEPA filtration system, and we know that from the report uh, that a small amount bypassed the HEPA filtration and went through the isolation dampers. And so we had about 200 uh, disintegrations per second that actually went past station B, and, and which is on the other side of the HEPA filtration, and exited into the environment. So we can see that the impact that the HEPA filtration system had it substantially reduced the amount of activity so that it, it didn't uh, impact the environment or uh, pose a risk to the employees. And then we get to our on-site air sampler and that air sampler is located roughly 100 feet north of where Station B uh, empties out. And so between Station B, which had 213 disintegrations per second, uh, we measured only a total and this is not a weekly average, this is a total amount per sample of 1.3 disintegrations per second. So you can see how the, the air and the turbulence and the winds pretty much dispersed and diffused this uh, americium. And then as you go a half mile northwest to our near field sampler, it got even further dispersed. So we measured a, a 0.65 disintegrations per second. Then you go to our air sampler that's 12 miles southeast, and, and the first sample we took uh, after the event was non-detectable, and then from February 16 to February 18, we actually measured a small trace of five thousandths of a disintegration per second. So I wanted to put this up to kind of show that, that the HEPA filtration system worked as designed. It reduced the contamination. And then once that small amount of contamination got out into the environment, it got further dispersed and further diffused uh, as the wind carried it away. And then you can see over time that the activities have dropped right now as of the last week that we have data points for within the repository. You're looking at a, a daily average of less than a quarter of a disintegration per second. So again, it's a one-time event. The levels have dropped. Coming out of station B, which is going into the environment, is about 0 0.05, 0 0.06 disintegrations per second. So again, very safe levels. I will point out these red numbers. Um, we've had to revise a couple of our latest results for the on-site sampler. Uh, as we went back and did our val validation verification uh, review, we found that we had a calculation error. Basically, we subtracted the wrong amount when we took out our tracers, and so we've had to revise those up. Um, this does not surprise me. If, if you look at our staff, we've processed more samples in the last two months than we normally do on a year's basis. And so when, you, when you're cramming that many samples into a two and three person department, and then they don't have time to go back and check their data, these things can happen. So I just wanted to point that out because uh, I know some of my friends like Don Hancock will notice if I change these data points and don't make reference to them. Uh, this graph just shows you the history uh, over time of the americium that we have detected at our three sampling sites near the WIP site. And so you'll notice that uh, for the last 14 years, the normal has been about 10 to the negative eighth. And this is uh, Becquerel's per cubic meter. So this takes into consideration flow volume and time, whereas the previous results are just uh, Becquerel's per sample. Uh, you can see that at the uh, lowest amount, we've had 10 to the, almost the negative 11th, and at the highest point before the event, 10 to the negative 7th. Obviously, when we had the event, was our highest period of 10 to the negative 4, so about four orders of magnitude above normal, but you'll notice our latest results are back at normal, and they're a little bit on the high end, but it's also the windy part of the year. And if you'll notice, each of these high periods or at the beginning of the year during the windy months. Uh, this graph also shows you the data points related to plutonium. Again, normal is about 10 to the negative eighth with a high of 10 to the negative seventh and a low of 10 to the negative ninth. Obviously, after the event, we had our highest point at 10 to the negative fifth, so a couple of orders of magnitude above zero. Again, the, the latest data points show that we're back to background or normal levels. 
And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, these exposure levels that, that have been detected uh, and estimated. Uh, I, I still run into people in town and they say, you know, is the air safe out at the WIP site? Or, or what, what risk did the workers really face uh, out at the WIP site during the event? And I know that the Department of Energy has estimated that if a person were standing at our sampling site for eight hours and took the brunt of that release, that they would have received a dose of between three and five millirem. But a lot of us don't understand what that means. So I went and researched, and according to the Health Physics Society, which is a group that they make their living of calculating dose, and, and George Brzezowski with the EPA is a health physicist, um, they, in their background radiation fact sheet, which was published in June of 2012, they quote that the average dose from all inhaled radionuclides is about 2.3 millisieverts per year. Now, we've heard of millirems, but we haven't heard of millisieverts, so I did a calculation, and 2.3 millisieverts is about 230 millirem per year. Well, the DOE has estimated that if a person were standing at that sampling site for eight hours, they would have received about five millirem. So put that into context, that's about 2% of a person's total annual dose that they could have inhaled had they been there for the total uh, eight hours around the release. Or to say that differently, that if you were standing at that sampling site for eight hours, your uh, average inhaled radioactive nuclides would have gone up from 230 to 235. So again, it's a very small amount. We, we don't mean to downplay it, and we don't mean to see, say that it, it wasn't uh, important, but from an annual point of view, it is a very small uh, amount of radionuclides that a person could have inhaled during that time period. Other than that, um, I can stand for questions if there are any. Okay, Russell, I currently have uh, four questions for you online, and, um, and that's probably all I'm going to get to because I go away from the monitoring that when I ask questions. Uh, first question, please describe your Station A and Station B sampling before the February 14th release. Okay. So as far as 2014 goes, the only uh, sampling that we have done, the only analysis of samples that we have done at Station A uh, is after the fire event. So we did an, an initial analysis of Station A filters uh, after February 5th, and those came up non-detectable for americium and plutonium. Uh, we normally run about two months behind on collecting Station A filters by the time we do the analysis and reporting. So we hadn't even gotten to them by the time the uh, underground radiation event happened. Okay. Uh, you have to excuse me, I'm going to, please explain how the first eight hour release of the event on Station A indicates the HEPA worked, given that it was only 20,000, 20, yeah, 20,000 BQ from failing within three filters in the bank. I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, well maybe we'll, we'll ask that person to possibly reword that. Uh, wouldn't some of the dispersion have gone into the soil? When will you release soil sampling results? So we should uh, have our soil sample results by this weekend, uh, and those will be re released, I, I would suspect, early next week, Monday or Tuesday. Okay. Uh, can, st can test station data be uploaded to the netc.com website for regular public access? Uh, we put all of our data on our website, so if they want to link to us, that's fine. Excuse me, Russell, um, if you're talking about radionuclides and uh, all sorts, I mean, we're mainly interested in the man-made type that are coming out of WIP. Right. So if, you're, if you've got a big glob of them and you're calling them from everywhere and everything, that doesn't really make me feel that much better. <laughs> you know, I'm interested in the man-made types. Well, and, and you're correct, um, and I'm not a health physicist, so we may have to rely on someone else, but I know when they do the dose calculations that they take the radioactive material into account, and so that goes into 
attributing the dose that is received. So even though it is americium and plutonium, uh, they take the level and the impact that that material would have and that is uh, included in the dose calculation. So that's still within the three to five milligram taking the, the particular radionuclide into account. Would a massive radiation spike lasting a few hours be underreported by your measuring system, assuming the event happened continuously over the entire sampling period? It would be underrepresented if you reported the Becquerel per cubic meter, but when you're reporting Becquerel per sample, that's the total amount of activity on the sample, regardless of time. Carlsbad has on the order of 80 to 90 years of potash mining experience and about the same number of years of oil and gas experience in Eddy County. Part of the background radiation picture in Eddy County is the radiation that issues from potash and also the radiation that issues from for example, norm or naturally occurring radioactive materials that have become quite a regulatory headache for the oil and gas industry in the last few years. Now, CMERC being an independent agency that is especially focused on background studies and on variability uh, of uh, natural background radiation, why has in the past, and especially now in the present, neither the DOE, nor CMERC, nor anybody else ever compared radiation or radiological releases from WIP to the background to which, for example, potash miners or oil and gas workers are routinely exposed without any consequences for health or anything else. Uh, that's a good question and something that we should take into advisement, uh, expand our horizons and look at other industries and what risk they may provide to the workforce. So we, we will take that into advisement. If we don't have any more questions, we will, uh, Dana's got some comments. And I, I, I don't think we really adequately addressed a question that we had from the lady here in the front. And George, would, would you explain, since you're a health physicist and you're representing our, our regulator, EPA, um, Millerem and the relationship Millerem has in that it's not how much radiation, it's the effect the radiation has on your body. So it, it's... And again, just like Dana had mentioned here, it's just the effect of, you know, it's the amount of radiation and the effect upon the body itself. So I mean, I mean, basically, you answer the question. I'm, you know, I like what you said. So, does that answer your question, ma'am? The the point I was trying to make is it it does. If you say that you have a five millirem exposure, that's the effect on the body. So if you were talking about a a lower energy radiation, you'd actually have to get more of that radiation to have a five millirem uh, exposure than you would from, say, a, a high energy radiation like cobalt-60. Am I still truthful, George? Correct. correct. Okay, I like to consult my experts. So. Well, I may have to pass this up to my folks up in headquarters here, but no, what Dana is saying is correct here. It's like the kind and the amount that you're getting. I mean, you know, we're out in New Mexico, beautiful sun, pretty much all like 300 and so many days out of the year here, you know, with that cosmic radiation, along with what's around in the ground here. We've got the gnome site not too far from the whip itself here. Radon, that's another con, you know, consideration that people need to take in mind here. And, you know, the state, uh, 
environmental department has a good radon program that we, uh, that we support with, um, with grant money here to carry on. So that's another thing that we always tell people to do in that to test their homes for radon. So that's another thing we mentioned there. Thank you, Judge. If there's no more questions, we can have some comments from Dana, and then we will open it up for general Q&As. Okay, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, uh, as, as long as we, we get this interest, uh, we, we want to be here to uh, status you and to answer your questions. Uh, we will continue to gather information and to uh, find out what really happened in the mine from the uh, radiation uh, release event. And um, it, as we go along, uh, it may not seem like we're getting a lot of answers, but what we are doing is we're eliminating possibilities. And that's very important in our process of identifying a path forward to how we're ultimately going to recover from this and return to operations. Thank you. We do. Um, the question was, do we have a picture prior to the RAD event? And we do have a picture that I showed a couple of weeks ago that showed the waste face, and that was taken after the fire but before the RAD event. In fact, it was taken actually the afternoon before the RAD event happened that evening. Yeah. And if you look closely, you'll see that those two roof bolts uh, are hanging in that picture as well. And I'll just add to that because that was a good question you asked earlier. One of the reasons when we made up the team composition to go down on these entries, our mining manager is one of the gentlemen that were in the Level B suits that went down, and we purposely put him in one of the lead functions because we wanted that expertise to be able to look and observe, not only take pictures, but actually do a good assessment of his thoughts and his perspective on what the mine conditions look like. I'm not sure I can hear you very well. Oh, okay. I can talk louder. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> I was saying that in layman's terms, can you describe what a magnesium oxide bag is? And is that uh, similar to the release that was leaked out during the uh, first release? Okay, I got the first part of the question. Your first part was, can uh, I... Ex not, uh, not the same as release, but uh, could the waste from that bag be uh, similar to what uh, No, the, um, the contents, that bag, that material in that bag, it's a polypropylene type material. It's not hazardous. And so it's somewhat similar. And I was trying to think of a good analogy. I started to bring in an example this afternoon. But if you think about like the like chairs you use out in the um, yard sometimes, there's like these, that webbing that sometimes you can get with on chairs. I don't know if you, they're that common anymore, but they used to be years ago. It's kind of a, a plastic type material, but it's pliable, it moves around. And so that's what these bags are made of. So there's no radiological hazards or hazards associated with those bags. Uh, what, would the bags be used for? what are they used for? They're used for, um, we want to make sure that, let's say, for instance, there's moisture in the mine. Um, we, it's an absorbent that absorbs moisture. 
and it also absorbs like carbon dioxide. So just like we breathe in oxygen and then we exhale carbon dioxide, some of the um, plastics that are in the waste, because the waste that a lot of the waste we receive is um, debris, it's things that um, you know could be plastic tools, plastic off of tools and things like that. Over time, that plastic as it degrades, it can give off carbon dioxide and so um, we use these bags and they actually absorb carbon dioxide. Um, we're looking at either sometime, maybe Saturday or Monday. We're looking at um, which one of those days is better for us. We've got to get some tools because each time we go in and we learn new data, then we have to get the right tools to go in for the next entry to make sure we can, you know, take advantage of what we want to see from that. And so um, it'll in, in the next few days. Okay. So you are correct. I'm not sure exactly what picture you're referring to, but that is, that is characteristic of our mind because the salt continuously moves. And so you will have conditions where sometimes the floor will come up a little bit. Sometimes the bolting, you know, the, the roof, the back moves. That's why we have a geotechnical program. We have geotechnical engineers that are constantly, and we have a geotechnical and underground maintenance group. And that is their job is to monitor those conditions. And then let's say for the floor heaving, we have equipment that would go in and then level that back out. And so through monitoring, we determine, and through maintenance, we um, take care of those issues like that, or if we have to put bolts in the roof to make sure that um, we minimize the cracking. But that is characteristic of this type mine, and so that's just part of our maintenance program. So those are not unusual conditions. Those are expected conditions, and we have a program that maintains that. And fixes it. And fixes it, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, but those type things will occur, so those are not surprises to us. It is, it's expected. remember you asking that question. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't have firsthand information that that occurred because I wasn't in the underground at that time and I wasn't on the other end of the phone. And I believe that was the response the other, the last time it was asked. So I'd, I do not have firsthand information to answer that question. But we will follow up on it. Thank we'll be glad to follow up. Um, is our, is our AI inspector here? Um, we've had 
some some microphone issues. I think we're working now, but sir, if you don't mind maybe coming up here too. Uh, several is are for both you and then and also for for some of the other folks here. Uh, these these two are paired together regarding the recommendations in the first fire and leak reports. Who is going to judge how effectively both NWP and DOE respond to each? And then how can we be sure that all safety shortcomings will be corrected without independent third party oversight when both NWP and CBFO fail to recognize these problems? And I don't know if who wants to approach it. Well, DOE and uh, NWP are in the process of developing corrective action plans that address the justifications of needs that the, uh, the Accident Investigation Board has identified. Um, these corrective action plans will be reviewed and verified all the way up through headquarters. The uh, corrective actions themselves will be validated uh, and then there will be a process that will uh, assess the effectiveness of the corrective action that's been implemented. And this will all be a high profile activity. It will have uh, lots of uh, independent uh, assessment throughout. Um, and um, it, it's a, um, a normal process. Uh, in DOE to have that independent validation and it's a valuable process and, and we're going to follow it. Okay, and uh, Dana, why don't we just uh, do this one for you as well. Um, and then we'll when NWP was initially awarded the contract for RIP, was it a no bid or were any other companies considered? Has NWP or the parent corporation URS ever been involved in any other contamination incidents? I'm sorry, I wasn't on the selection. I came on board in uh, in December. Okay, I, I don't know if there's somebody else who wants to answer that, or maybe when, when Mr. Franco returns. It's, it's a basically a question about URS's past passage by your. Yeah, URS has a uh, a very solid record of uh, nuclear formality of operations at other sites. Most of those sites I've operated. And uh, there are minor events that are reported in the Department of Energy system. And, uh, and when those events occur, the department uses that basically as a demerit against the companies that are competing for the contracts. And so that, that's heavily weighted. And, um, and all of that gets vetted uh, very formally. And all of our companies compete in an open competition and um, and our record usually uh, is what causes us to be selected or or else not selected and and I can actually validate that from my perspective that I, I did lead a selection process a number of years ago where we actually did select URS and uh, a good deal of that was based on their outstanding uh, record When we talk about independence, who, what, what does that mean? Well, our, our headquarters oversight is independent and of itself. And then we have an independent uh, verification branch in DOE um, and a, kind of a regulatory unit that will be uh, getting involved. In fact, uh, they, they have representation here. Uh, at the site now, and uh, I anticipate they will continue their involvement. Um, no, I mean, I, I can't really speak to anything beyond what, what Dana said, other than, you know, in the typical process, um, somebody who's independent of the line management that makes the decisions and develops the corrective actions will be involved in the verification, whether they come from headquarters or another site. Um, and they'll probably still be, you know, DOE or DOE affiliated employees, but they would be independent of the decisions that were made and implemented here. Okay. Uh, what I do, maybe two more, and then we'll see if anybody else in the audience has any. Uh, what exactly is the 
exact improvements in equipment maintenance will be enacted after the fire in that old truck? So the question was uh, maintenance, uh, not only from the fire event, but also uh, some maintenance deficiencies that are identified from the radiological release event. And uh, I know not all of you were here last week where I did a, a reasonably detailed briefing on the improvements that we've made uh, with much, much more improvement yet to be made. But conduct of maintenance is a significant weakness for us. Um, not just underground, but, uh, but above ground. And so we're dedicating much more of our priority, much more of our funding to addressing the equipment deficiencies that, that have been allowed to accumulate over the years. So uh, the specific question was about underground mining equipment, and, and we'll replace all of that underground mining equipment. We're already beginning to make those purchases. But, but we're going to redirect not only our manpower, our executive, priority, but our funding priorities to uh, conduct and maintenance. Okay, and uh, why don't I... You want to borrow mine? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to do this. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I hate being on camera. Okay. Uh, this is a question for, our, I think, for our inspector. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about the green burst arc flashed? Um, what was the accident analysis indicating that that was? I, um, <clears throat> you know, we we looked at that, you know, the, the the green arc or flash that was reported right before the event that occurred in the switchyard, um, right near the fence line of the facility. Um, that uh, we were told by you know electrical and power engineers is not an uncommon event to occur. It's uh, an arc flash that can occur if there's some sort of dust buildup on the outside of these transformers which are very high voltage and causes a, a, a brief arc, a flash, and usually a loud noise would go along with that. Um, so it's not uncommon, although the timing of that was suspicious, but we couldn't find a link to that in any way. For those, for those of you listening at home, we're changing the microphone on our um, cordless battery, so uh, we're doing the best we can here. Uh, next question, is the DOE telling the public there are no safety limits or set points for safety systems at WIP? And is the DOE telling us that based on the accident, they can still the pub tell the public there are no safety limits or settings or safety systems at WIP? Okay. I. I I think some of the terminology may be misunderstood and he's probably referring to safety class systems which is a, a, a term from your nuclear safety basis uh, which would be put in place if there's a, you know a, a major accident hypothesized that could have um, a large impact to the public I, I I'm not an expert in that area but you know, I believe the guidelines are usually around 25 rem off-site dose is when a safety class uh, control would normally be put in place. I don't know if I don't know if Bob or Tammy knows anything other, you know, different or expand on that. So maybe while we're fielding, other, see if maybe they could elaborate. Uh, Jack may be guessing right as to what what they were referring to, but for folks that have seen the radiological release accident investigation board report. Okay. 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 And if you don't mind repeating this, please. It says the TSR says there are no safety limits at all. Okay. Um, and I think that again is a misunderstanding. So TSR is a form is a document that we produce. It's part of our license called Technical Safety Requirements. And and in the Technical Safety Requirement, right up front, it will talk about there are no. I'm trying to get the terminology exactly right. There are no commercial power reactor kinds of limits. I think the TSR actually says there are no safety limits required, the, the kind of uh, license requirement that would apply to a reactor. But then the technical safety requirements go on to name all of the many requirements that do apply. And then Jack was talking about the fact that if you read the report, it questions the adequacy 
of how we've classified particularly our ventilation system and, and that's an important part of our corrective actions is to go reconsider whether we've adequately classified it in the system of classification in the Department of Energy. So, uh, so that, was a, that was a question, actually a criticism that was raised and now I'm looking at whether, uh, whether we should stay and defend that level of classification or, or whether we should increase it. But there are many, many technical safety requirements defined and implemented at WIP. In the radio, radiological release accident report, or in the investigation report, the uh, chief assumption on the cause of the radiological release was either roof fall or roof bolt failure. Uh, while saying that the final uh, finding has to await you know, further uh, investigations, that was the assumption. The, or the working assumption, I should say. Anyone who knows anything about the rock mechanics and the rock mechanics program at WIP would have thought, I believe, that both of those explanations were extremely unlikely in room, one, in room 7, panel 7. So I'm wondering what the investigative team based that working assumption on when anyone who had really relevant mining knowledge would have probably considered these explanations highly unlikely. Well, I, I don't recall the report exactly being written that it assumes that it was a rock fall. I think it believed that, that uh, you know, a back fall was uh, a likely possibility but also included things such as you know, pressurization uh, or release from a waste drum and other potential mechanisms that we could not go physically investigate at the time because there was no access to the mine. So we couldn't lay eyes on it. And we, we did look at the ground control program and I would agree that the ground control program at WIP is an excellent program, uh, seems to be very effective and uh, however, you know, the geotechnical experts also said you are also messing with Mother Nature to some extent. So just because you make it almost incredible doesn't mean the incredible can't occasionally happen. I was just curious about the picture that was taken of the waste before the rat event. Does that show anything that's gone on with the MGO sacks? No, or can you tell? You can tell. You can't really tell, you can't get as far, you can't see as far back as the pictures I showed today, but just at the waste space, um, it didn't show anything. Would okay. you mind answering that again? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So the question was, I had mentioned earlier, there was a picture taken the afternoon before the rat event, and the question was, did it show any disturbance of the waste bags? And from that perspective, um, it did not. It did not go as far back as the pictures I showed this afternoon, but um, from the front of the waste space, it did not show any abnormalities. These are, uh, some of these are follow-up questions, uh, and Tammy, since you were just speaking, we'll do the one. Uh, there was a question about the cast, there was a question if there's any neutron shielded casks in panel seven. I think it was a follow-up to the one we asked earlier. There are not. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do a couple easy ones here just to move on. Now, once approved by CBFO, is the fire corrective action plan gonna be posted on the website? The fire corrective action plan will be issued and we haven't decided if we're posting it on the website. It will be a pretty uh, large document by the time all said and done and there will be an element of it from the contractor. There will be an element of it from CBFO, our actions, and there will be an element of it from headquarters where headquarters actually has actions as well. So uh, there, there's actually actually going to be a, a wide range of, of different actions and probably a couple of different documents involved. Okay, and I will attempt this one. Do the isotopic rations from room samples match any of the isotopics from the containers in the room, 
or are they not distinctive enough to make a match? The, the AM241 rations seem very high, even accounting for the relative specific activities of AM and PU, and should be distinctive enough to find out which container may have leaked and its location in the room. Uh, we also had a similar question about just the contents of panel seven, you know, what kind of waste is there? So. Okay, and, and this question's come up in, in previous meetings, but uh, it's worth repeating. Um, so as you look at the pictures, basically we can begin to bound what the apparent affected area is. It's still a pretty large area, but we begin to bound it. And so as part of our detective work, I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised that we're studying very carefully in that affected area, what are the containers? And, and I'm going to call it fingerprints. And, and does their nuclear fingerprint match what we found in the release? And so that, that is an important part of the detective work we're doing. And there are quite a large number of containers that, that match that. But we're using that in order to narrow down to uh, what are the containers that could have been the origin of the release. Because clearly we know one thing happened. At least one, and maybe more than one container leaked was damaged somehow. We don't know whether it was caused by a structural problem with the mine. And my mine engineers are delighted that the, that the mine structure looks very, very good. We can't rule that out, but, but it looks very good. And my uh, container experts are just as defensive of the fact that nothing could go wrong with their containers. But we know that at least one container leaked. I mean, that's indisputable. And, uh, and we're looking very carefully at in that affected area, which containers would have a fingerprint that would match up with what we found in the release. And uh, the fact that it's, that, uh, that the fingerprint's dominated by the americium content really helps us narrow that down. But not, we haven't been able to narrow it down enough to, to be conclusive with it, but it's helping us narrow, narrow down what, what, uh, what are the likely containers that, that were damaged. Okay. And, and just to let people online know, I've got multiple, it's going very fast today on the questions, and so I'm probably not getting all of them. Um, we're going to, we'll probably ask a couple more here. We could then. finish early, but I, I know that's not likely, but we could, okay. <clears throat> that, that's not up to me, but um, we have several more questions about the, uh, the arc. Uh, one of them was, could, could americium have caused such a flash? And then the other is, whips mine ventilation exhaust into its electric substation, given the reported arc flashing, is, is this not a single point failure for station blackout during radioactive release? So two more questions about okay, the arc You want to flash. start with the arc? Okay. I guess with, with regards to the arc, um, the arc, I mean, that's the location release underground is several thousand feet away from the location where the arc occurred, as well as over 2,000 feet down in the earth. It would have taken uh, approximately 30 minutes for the release to even made it to station A, let alone the tiny amount that made it through to station B. Um, and the, so the, the arc occurred long before that would have, would have, could have even been a thought. Then let me, uh, so I think there was a question sort of related to reliability of power. So we have very reliable power supply but uh, we also have very dependable uh, backup diesel uh, engines and generators that are connected to those diesel engines. And so uh, we have highly reliable power, but just in case we have a problem, we have independent uh, diesel-powered uh, generators that, that we engage. Okay. Uh, do you want to... I have read that there was an exothermic reaction when you added that foam to the uh, dampers. And obviously that's heat. I mean, I know a little bit about <laughs> determining the word. But that is correct. Explain right. what caused that? We, um, we used a foaming, foaming agent, a pretty common foam, one that, uh, that you could apply fairly easily with standard equipment and then would solidify fairly rapidly. Those, that were, those were our goals. And, and, and the chemical there is a chemical reaction that generates heat. And so that did occur uh, when we were applying some of the foaming agent. 
No, ma'am. Okay. No, that part of the, the goal is that it basically the exothermic reaction causes it to set up and stop reacting very promptly. But it, but it did generate some heat and we did have to stop the addition of the foam at that point. Now that it seems to be established that the contamination is uh, limited to panel 7 and then the paths from panel 7 towards the exhaust shaft, that means by implication, I guess, that the um, rest of the underground is clean. So um, does that mean that, for example, the scientists that um, run the physics experiments in the north end of the mine uh, have access to that by now or if not why not so um, we've reported the last several entries were very encouraged um, by the levels of contamination we found we were prepared for it to be much much larger you know one or two orders of magnitude greater and so as we think about a recovery planning and again for those who weren't here last week our goal is by the end of this month to publish our initial recovery plan where we'll define a schedule and then a cost associated with that schedule for resuming operations and that would include some of the science areas that at this point look like they probably were not affected with contamination. So we've got to be very cautious as we proceed with that but we're hopeful that as we so right now all of our attention is on finding the cause of the event. And although I'd love to go out and characterize areas where it would be simple to, to go back into some kind of limited, limited operation, right now every entry we're making is related to finding the cause of the event. Um, but we're encouraged that the levels of contamination uh, are much, much less than we, than we, we feared they might be. Okay. Since we were time constrained last week, do we have some yeah, relevant to the board report? Board report. Yeah, a lot of them are somewhat for them and somewhat for them. Okay, um, just, to, just to clarify there what, uh, what Ben said is um, because uh, our access to our um, AIB investigators is limited, if we want to take questions specifically for them, we're going to do that today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just ask two quick ones while people type those questions. Uh, the April 23rd entry measured 66 millirem per hour. What were the levels yesterday? Russell, Repeating. the April 23rd entry, Russell, I believe this was for you, April 23rd entry measured 66 millirem per hour. What were the levels yesterday? And then uh, while he's looking that up, I'll go ahead and ask the next question. Are the companies that send and deliver the packages for storage being audited? Basically, uh, uh, several questions about the independent review of, of the waste packages that are sent to WIP. Who looks at those? For the... For the sites that generate the waste and, and all of the Department of Energy sites that, that have had a mission with respect to weapons production generate this kind of waste, some of them have finished uh, their mission and have been completely cleaned up, but, but all of them generated some waste. And the rules are very, very strict on how they go about doing that and how that gets verified by an independent crew of people. And that's partly why the, the people that that create those rules and do that independent verification have been have been saying it, it it's simply not credible that the problem could have occurred in one of those containers but there is a very independent uh, validation done at the places where the waste is generated before it's allowed and it's called certified so it's certified to meet all of the requirements for WIP and the requirements to go on the road in the shipping containers and uh, the independence of that is uh, is is very high but we can't rule that out um, so although we know that the structure of the mind is is very solid and we know that the rules around packaging the waste are extraordinary something happened and so we can't rule either one of those out at this point now back to I'm not sure Russell had the answer I'm not sure I'm connecting with the 66 millirem, but uh, maybe if they could, if you could communicate back with them, see if we can connect that a little better. Okay, all right. Um, or you can ask them if, that's, if they're talking about the direct dose or they've made a conversion of the airborne contamination. Okay. Now, what I will say, you know, maybe this will prompt um, 
the levels of contamination with yesterday's entry were very similar to what we saw last week. Tammy said it, the maximum we found uh, was around 20,000 disintegrations per minute alpha contamination. And, um, and then in terms of the air activity, and I don't think, Tammy, we probably reported that tonight, but that, that continues to be a couple of orders of magnitude below what we were prepared for. And, and the maximum was in the order of about 25, and the units are called derived air concentration, or DACs. Okay, but need, none of those numbers match up with, with milli-rims or 66. Yeah, we'll, okay, okay. Um, a, a couple of questions that were, were directed. Um, do you have any insight into, the, this is for an inspector, do you have any insight into the reasons there were so many shortcomings in NWP safety culture and DOE oversight? Well, I, mean, I think think it was captured in the report fairly well, um, and the you know insight was provided there. You know, I don't want to speculate. You know, like for for causes of that. I mean, we really deal with the facts and the analysis, and there were obviously there were num numerous indicators of of weaknesses with the safety culture that had gone on for for several years at least. Okay. Uh one question, I believe this has been asked before, but not to you. Uh, did, did your group notify the FDA or not? And if not, why not? The Food and Drug Administration? I believe that is the question, yes. No, we did not notify the FDA and don't know of any requirement where we would have or should have notified the FDA. Okay, does, does your group have a level of certainty that no americium escaped with prior to the alarm sounding during the investigation. Yeah, related to this event, similar to what I explained a moment ago about the americium not making it to contribute to the arc flash, uh, it was calculated it would take about 30 minutes for the americium to travel through the mine and up the shaft until it reached the station A. Um, and we did verify that the cam alarmed uh, and that they shift to a filtration mode uh, within a matter of minutes, well before you know, the 30 minutes where the material would have, would have been able to make it to that point. There's also a sample line too. If I can follow up on the 66 millirem, I did a little bit opposition research yesterday and checked on Don Hancock's website, and he has that number there. Let me just quote that sentence to you. They, he's referring to the people who did the entry into panel seven, they detected 10,000 dpm of alpha and 3,000 dpm of beta gamma radiation at the waste phase. They, dis they detected 10,000 dpm of alpha and 6,000 dpm beta gamma at the slider window in room six near, the bay, near, near, near that back, and then in parentheses, outlet air side of the containers. And then he says, which they calculated as 66 millirem per hour of activity. I think that's where the 66 millirem is coming from. And I think the question was how many millirem were found then at the, re -ent at the entry yesterday, I guess. So those levels are correct. Now remember um, what Tammy's shown us each week. They were wearing extraordinary respiratory protection which has several orders of magnitude capability of protecting the wearer from that level of activity. So their exposure was zero, okay? Um, no exposure because the protection they were wearing had much, much, much more capability than, than what was in the air, okay? We're not seeing any more questions about the report online, so I was gonna say three more questions online or any locally. We'll start online. Okay. Uh, it, I'm sorry. Reality is, is a credible accident. But, um, but in this license that we write, called a documented safety analysis, and the controls that, that come out of it called technical safety requirements, it, it's proven very conclusively that, that that scenario of a criticality accident is simply not possible. And the accident investigation board. So, so my safety document proves it, and they confirmed it. And and this was not a criticality accident. Something did happen, but it was not a criticality accident. 
we're still down on life. Uh, WIP is considered a hazard category two facility, correct? That is correct. And the number one would probably be a nuclear plant. A, a power reactor, yeah. yes ma'am. Okay. okay. Now, would you have to conclude that the ventilation system at WIP was never adequate? Now speak for the contractor and then, you know, Jack. You for, know, a, for a facility yeah. that's category two. Now in this case, the ventilation system worked. There was some leakage, which we're going to address, and, and, and that's an oversight, and we'll fix that. But, but it was installed, it was designed, it, it was installed, and it did function properly. The leakage is an issue that, uh, that the Accident Investigation Board pointed out, and we're going to take that on, and we're going to solve that problem. So uh, I think in that, that leakage was unacceptable. Um, but the rules did cause the system to be designed and installed and operated, but the leakage was not acceptable, and, and we'll fix that. And I, I think the question was dealing with the uh, safety category of the system itself, and we, we did conclude that the, the, this particular release probably challenges the conclusion that uh, it should not be